Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. I am Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. And for the next five weeks, I hope you uh, don't get too bored because I'm up. For the next five weeks, I'm going to be talking. Uh, We're going to be sharing some stuff, but before we do, I want to present something really cool that happened to you guys this week. We had somebody come to Pastor Marcus and say, I really want to get that building finished out there. The building that you've seen over there, that is going to be a new admin building for us. We need more space. If you have not figured that out, uh, we need more space, and there's just not a whole lot of places to go. So somebody gave us this building over here, but we need to put that together. They said, this person came and said, I would like to give up to $20,000 to match, basically a matching gift. We've all heard of matching gifts, right? Or if, if, if the church can round up $10,000, that person will give $10,000. And some of you go, well, why don't they just give the $20,000? Here's why. Because that person has the unique motivational gift of what's called a giver. And givers, some people who have this gift, they like to motivate other people to give because they've seen the power of what giving can do. And they say, they see the power of when, you, when you're generous and open-handed. I mean, Jesus said that. He said, man, you basically get to decide how much people give to you by how much you give to others. And so givers have this unique gift in the body that they will encourage and motivate us to give. So the way they, this, this person's doing it, I don't even know who it is, but they said, up until the end of September, if you guys can get $20,000 in, I'll match that $20,000, which would give us $40,000 to finish that building debt-free. So... If you are interested in being part of that gift, you're basically giving more than $1,000. You're giving $2,000. If you give $2,000, you're giving $4,000. Um, we have ways to give that'll be up on the screen here. I'll present it again at the end too. Best way to give is online. It's the easiest way. Or you can drop a check. Uh, you can drop the $20,000 check right there in the back as you leave if you want. It'll all be done and you won't hear me talk about it again next week. So, all right. Y'all ready for this? So, I need to give you a warning about what's up for the next five weeks. I have been writing a new book. It's called Keep It Light. It's due August 30th. You guys are going to be the first ones to hear this presented. Now, if you've been coming here regularly, you have probably heard all of these things in different forms, just if you've been paying attention, Uh, because I've already talked about a lot of these things, but I'm putting them together in this series called Keep It Light, where we're talking about the power of priorities in life, in work, and in relationships and love. But here, here's the really important thing to understand. Normally, I'm up here Mr. Teaching Pastor, right? Okay? But there's this other side of Joel that some of you know, some of you don't. I'm kind of intense. Kind of. Dave. And I used to be a leadership coach. In fact, I still do some of it. And what I'm going to share over the next five weeks is the stuff that I would go through with my leaders, like high capacity leaders. And I would go through this material with them and we would help them start new businesses. We would help them kind of figure out how to get things that were in chaos in order. But most importantly, we would figure out how to take the burden off of their shoulders and free up time, money, and resources for what they really felt called to do. What I'm about to share with you could literally completely change your life, but it's really hard. I'll just warn you. And I know it's really hard because I've had to do all of this myself. About seven years ago, I looked around, had a daughter that had just been born, and I looked around and I go, I don't really like the way I've set up my life. I need to change some stuff. And I wasn't out, you know, blatantly sinning. I just didn't like the direction things were going. And I'm like, why do I feel like I'm always barely keeping my head above water? Why do I feel like I'm always short on time? Why do I feel like I'm always short on money? Why do I feel like I'm just like a slave to other people's obligations for me? And I decided, I don't like this anymore. And I hired this coach. And this is what the coach told me. He said, the only thing holding you back right now is your mindset. And I said, that's ridiculous. You know what's holding me back is I don't have any money. I don't have any time. I don't have any connections. And he's like, The only thing holding you back is your mindset. And over the next few months, he started dismantling the way I saw the world. And between that and prayer and reading through scripture, it changed the way I see everything. And it was really hard to do. And I want to share with you today, over the next five weeks, the steps I took and the steps that I believe if you take could literally change your world. Because you know what's holding most of you back? 
your mindset. That's why Paul says, don't be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by a new mindset. So I want to share that with you. If you're ready, now I might get a little intense, okay? And some of you might go, Joel's a psycho. (laughs) And if you think I'm a psycho after this, that's fine, but it's working out well for me. And when people say, hey, I don't agree with you, I'm like, well, let me ask you, how's your way working out for you? Anyway, so... A few years ago, um, you know, I lead these outdoor expeditions around the world, right? I went out and bought this huge duffel bag. And I was like, this duffel bag, I I was going to get the smaller one. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to get the huge duffel bag just to make sure I have extra space whenever I go places so that when I come back, I can buy souvenirs and gifts for people, coffees, things like that. Emily and I have a rule. We don't buy souvenirs, but we buy food because it's consumable, right? Um... So I bought this big bag thinking, yeah, every time I go somewhere, I'll leave a lot of space in it so I have room for stuff to come back. Invariably, I have not had one single trip that this bag did not go down completely full. And I, I'm literally like, the night before, I'm like, how did so much stuff get in this bag again? I'm like pushing it down and trying to zip. Any, anybody relate to that? Yeah. The women to <laughs> Marianne. I love Marianne's commentary on the second row here. She's like, the women, yeah. Hey, it's me too. And the crazy thing is, I always end up coming home with stuff that I never used. But my concern was, what if I need it? Because haven't we all been in a position where we're like, what if I, and, and you, I need, I should have just thrown that in there the last minute. And what's really tricky is when you go to somewhere where you don't know what the weather's going to be. Like you come to Texas right now, you just know, just, just pack underwear. Like, just run around in your skivvies, you'll be fine, nice and cool, right? But like, sometimes we go to really cool places. We were in Peru a few weeks ago, and in the morning, it's freezing cold, but by the time you're hiking in the afternoon, you're burning up. So we're all hiking, and we're like, start out with our parkas on, and then 10 minutes into the hike, you're like, (gasps) trying to strip down so you don't pass out from heat exhaustion. And I think there's this tendency that we all have, we just end up filling our bag with stuff, And I'm not just talking about travel anymore. I'm talking about life. Because every one of us in life, we're kind of on a journey. And there's certain stuff we take with us. But a lot of us, we're kind of like somebody that's hiking in bear country. And you hear, man, there's bears around here. So be careful. So you find a big rock and you go, this will be handy if I find a bear. (laughs) You're like, but wait, what if it's a mother bear with two cubs? And you're like, oh, better get two. So you pick up two rocks and you put them in your backpack. And before you know it, you're like... And you wake up one morning and you go, I'm tired and I don't want to do this anymore. Because most of us are completely overwhelmed in our backpack and there's nothing for any, no room for anything else. Anybody relate to that? I was thinking about some of the places we're overwhelmed in our life. Demands on our time. How many of us were just like, I just don't have time to do anything. And when I do have time to do stuff, all I want to do is sleep. But I'm guessing you also have sleep problems because we, because you've got anxiety related to how much stuff you have to do. So you can't actually sleep. Financial burdens. How many of us, man, we just, just looking at our finances and going, this is not going well. You realize every month you're coming out in the red and going, I'm spending more than I make every morning, every month. And I'm, I just, I don't understand how people can survive in this economy anymore. How do people do it? What's funny is that's so subjective. I'll never forget, I had a guy come to me in coaching one time, and we were talking, and he's like, I just don't know how anybody can make it on 150K a year anymore. And I was like, I'll show you how to make it three times on 150K a year. Because that's about what I make, a third of that, right? Like, but you get, it gets subjective, and you start to fill your life, because it's like your bag, well, I got $150,000 a year coming in. Well, why don't I fill my life with $150,000 worth of obligations? And you show up at the car lot and they're like, you know, for just an extra $200 a month, you could be driving this. And you're like, dang, I look good in that. (laughs) And gosh darn it, I work hard. I deserve that. And the next thing you know, you got a $750 a month car payment. Right? Again, I'm going to get intense. Do with it what you want. 
Things that consume our energy emotionally, relationally. How many of you, man, this, it's just that, 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 like life's pretty good except when you get home. <laughs> and you're just, oh my gosh, we're going to argue about this again? And, or, or you get home and you're like, can you just give me some space? I've been dealing with junk all day long and I come home and I got to deal with this when I get home. You're just exhausted. Plus the weight of just like, some of us, man, like the, the, the weight of being, feeling alone, right? Some of us hang out with people we don't like just so we aren't alone. Got quiet. Some of us are under the weight of, of like obligations we feel, like worry about what will people think. The emotional weight. I talked to so many people, the emotional weight of what people would think. The other day, somebody was like, yeah, we had to tell our realtor we're not selling our house anymore. And I, they're going to get so mad at me. I'm like, who freaking cares what your realtor thinks? I'm a realtor. Realtors are a dime a dozen. They'll find another house to sell. But they're all so worried about telling the realtor no. And I'm like, they, you're going to sell your house just to make the realtor happy? Where are you going to live? <laughs> but people live under that. We live under that emotional weight of what are people going to think? And some people, that's harder than others. That's honestly not hard for me. For Emily, it is, though. <laughs> Emily's always like, what's the cashier at the grocery store going to think? Well, I'm like, who freaking cares what the grocery store is? <laughs> and I'm not talking about being mean. I'm just like, stop worrying about what they're going to think. Because most of the time, you know what? They're not thinking about you. <laughs> they're thinking about them. Just like you're thinking about you, they're thinking about them. Anyways. I digress. That one thing that just creeps creating tension. So here's the thing. We're all weighed down with this huge bag, and Jesus comes along, and he's like, hey, guys, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. A yoke was just it's this piece of wood they would put over two oxen to help pull the load, right? They'd carry the load. And you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you would actually say you feel that right now? Don't wait. Don't raise your hand. But most of us, I don't think we could say, I really feel like the yoke is easy and burden is light. Because most of us have taken on, I believe, more than God intends for us. And here's the thing about when you're yoked up with, with, in a, on a yoke with another ox. If you pull ahead, you're going to carry more weight. If you lag behind out of fear of moving forward, you're going to pull more weight. And much of life, the burden we're carrying is heavier than God intends for us. But you know why it's heavier? Because we've created unnecessary suffering. Now, let me explain something. This is really important. There are two kinds of suffering in life. There's necessary suffering. There's a verse in Acts that says, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. I wish it not, that was not in there. I wish it said, through much Krispy Kreme donuts or Twinkies, we re-enter the kingdom of God. But it says, through much suffering. For whatever reason, God has chosen to use suffering to build strength and character within us. There's certain suffering you're just not getting around in life. And listen, this is what Jesus is saying here. He's like, look, you've got a burden to carry. He's like, you've got to carry something. Responsibility gives your life meaning. Trying to get rid of all responsibility? Well, that's the problem we have in our world today. A lot of people are like, life is meaningless. Well, that's because you haven't taken on a drop of responsibility. You're still living with your parents. You, All right. You have to carry a burden of responsibility. It's part of what brings life meaning. Kids, good Lord, what a burden of responsibility. But man, there's so much meaning that comes to that. I realized this last few weeks ago when we were in Peru. I was like, you know what? I don't like traveling without my daughter anymore because the best part of traveling now is watching her learn. So I had to change kind of the way I see the world. But responsibility is that there's this responsibility we are called to carry. But Jesus says, if the weight of life is too heavy, it's probably because you're carrying something you weren't intended to carry. Because you know what we do? Naturally, we add stuff. We just always do it. If you think about the first, you know, what was the first sin that happened? Adam and Eve. Eve, the serpent said to her, hey, what did God tell you to do? And God had told her this. You got the run of the place. Just don't eat from this one tree. And what did Eve do? She added to the command. She's like, God said, don't eat or don't even touch that. She added to it. It's the natural tendency. We tend to add things. And then it got worse when sin entered the world because we felt a lack. And we're always like, oh, what if I need it? What if I need it? 
what if I need that person over there to, be, to have my back? So, so even though they're doing dysfunctional things and, and hurting me over and over again, I'm going to keep sticking with them, even though I don't really like them, but I might need them someday. And in the meantime, they're damaging you and hurting you. We're always worried. What if I, and we end up with this heavy, 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 heavy bag. And here's, here's the thing. We decide what's going to go in that bag based on where we think we're going in life. And here's another reality I've seen in life. Most of us have a better idea of what we don't want than what we actually do want. We know for sure, I don't want to be poor. Because I, I felt that growing up. So we just run as hard as we can to get as much money as we can. We'll say, how much is not going to make you poor? Well, a little bit more. I had a guy in my coaching program. I said, how much do you need to stop working at this pace? He gave me a number. I think it was like $2 million. Maybe it was a little less. I can't remember. I said, bro, with inflation, $2 million is not going to cut it. And he was like, oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. $3 million. I was like, okay. Hey, but $3 million, how long is it going to take you to make $3 million? Seven years. <laughs> Seven years, $3 million is going to be nothing. Dang. All right. I'm going to need $4 million. Well, how long is it going to take you to make $4 million? Ten years. Dude, I'm telling you, with inflation. The bottom line, I was trying to mess with the guy. There's no amount that's going to be enough. And some of you, you just, you don't know what you want. You just know you don't want to be poor. So it's always, I'll just do a little bit more. And that's why it got real quiet in here. Some of you, I just don't want to be alone. So you'll date anyone. But at least you're not alone. Right? Again, I told you I was going to get intense. Forgive me. But this is stuff I've had to realize in my life. Some of you are hanging out with people you know you shouldn't be hanging out with, but it's better than sitting at home alone on a Friday night. I don't want to be insignificant. That's my thing. I don't want to be insignificant. So for the longest time, I'd just do anything I could to find places to be influential. We have a world that's like that today, and I don't want to be insignificant. And how do we judge significance? By how many likes you get on a, on a, on a stupid phone. Most of us have better idea what we don't want than what we do want. But, and, and here's the thing. There's this verse that says this, where there is no prophetic vision, that's simply a picture of where you want to go. The people cast off restraint. They'll just throw anything in the bag. Cast off, you have no packing or instruction, instructions or order. You just throw anything in the bag because, well, I might need it. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And the law is simply this, a, a strict framework for what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Because what you're going to do with your time, money, and energy is really the most important thing, decision we're going to make in our life. What are you going to do with that? After the decision to follow Christ, the decision is what are you going to do with what he's given you, which is stewardship. And, and listen, listen, Jesus said this. This is one of the most powerful things he said. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we've talked about this with money, but this goes applies to anything. If you want to know, I put it this way. If you want to know what you value, look at what you do with your treasure, your time, your money, your energy. Because wherever your time, money, and energy are put, it shows where your heart is. And that's just a principle. There's no way around that. If we talk for long enough, I could figure out what you value pretty quickly based on what you talk about most. And based on what you do with your money, well, even more than what you talk about, more, what you do. Man, I just, I just really love my kids so much. That's why I work 14 hours a day to give them a life I never had growing up. Okay, maybe in your mind you say you love your kids, but really what you love is having money to give to your kids. Because if you really loved your kids, I would think presence would be the most important thing. Here's one. All right, now, I'm going to really step on toes, so if, don't, if you get offended, I'm sorry. This worked for me. The education system. I am obsessed. The most important thing for me is for my daughter to have a Bible-based education. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, 
The grass will fade and the flowers will wither, but the words of the Lord will live on forever. Amen. There's a few things that are going to live on beyond this life. And one of them is not going to be knowledge of mathematics and science. One of them is this. It's the words of the Lord. So I want my daughter pumped full of the Bible, period. She is not going to get that, no, no matter how good the secular education she gets. She's not going to get that. You don't go sending your kid to Caesar and wonder why your kid came back as a Roman. So I intentionally don't drive a nice car and I live in a very tiny house. If you've seen my house, I live in a very tiny house because I need money to pay for my child's Christian education because it's really important to me. It's a value to me. And you always have to sacrifice for what's of greatest value to you. And here's the crazy thing. You naturally sacrifice for what's of greatest value to you. You naturally do it. If you look at where you spend your money, it'll tell you what's most important to you. And here's the, here's the sad part. A lot of us don't even think about what we value. We just kind of take what the world around us values and says, I guess that's what I need to value. I have a friend. She's a realtor. She drives this car that's literally destroying her. It's bankrupting her. She's been kicked out of her apartment multiple times, but she has to preserve the car because in her mind, to get contracts as a realtor, she has to drive this Mercedes-Benz. Listen, nothing wrong Mercedes-Benz. I wish I had one. But we're limited. And the most important thing to her is to look successful, not to actually be successful, but to look successful. So she spends a crazy, ridiculous amount of money. She's lost apartments in order to make her car payment. And you go, well, that's dumb. Hey, it's something she values. And listen, I can guarantee there's something in your life that you value that much too. For me, Christian education is super important. I will do whatever it takes. If I have to take a, a job as a greeter at Walmart in the evenings to pay for my daughter's Christian education, mark my words, I will do whatever it takes because I refuse to let my kid be indoctrinated. And listen, make no mistake, secular education is about making good citizens. So whatever the government dictates is a good citizen, that's what they're going to teach at the school. Unfortunately, but what they're saying is a good citizen lately is not what I agree with anymore. Okay? And I'm not dogging. If you are a teacher, thank God you're in the, out there, okay? But don't fall for the idea that the government is for you teaching you things that are really the most important values. The most important values are in the Word of God, and that's what we get. Okay? <laughs> And I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying this is the reality of where the Christian worldview bumps up against the secular worldview. Those are values for me, okay? So, so here's where things come in conflict. We're limited. I only have so much money that I make every month. And I'm a pastor slash whatever I am, so it's not a whole lot. <laughs> so at some point I have to decide. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. The church is really too generous with me here. But uh, anyway... I have to decide what's going to go and what's going to stay because I can't take everything in my bag. So I got to at some point go, yep, I got to make some space and take some stuff. Where's the zipper on this thing anyway? I'm going to have to take some stuff out of the bag. And sometimes it's fun stuff. Good catch. But, but here's the thing, what, what I choose to keep and what I choose to sacrifice reveals what I value, but that's where the conflict comes in. And there's always a tension point, okay? And what's fascinating is usually the tension point comes relationally. So the first story about relational tension in the Bible is, is these two brothers, Cain and Abel. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. So they both come and they offer to the Lord a sacrifice. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. He said, Abel, I like what you've given to me. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. First mention of anger in the Bible has to do with sacrifice. The Lord said to Cain, hey, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. This word sin is a fascinating word. It's an archery term. It means you aimed at the wrong thing. There are wrong sacrifices. You don't get credit just because you made a sacrifice. You only get credit if the sacrifice is in line with something the Lord values. And here's the really scary thing. You can love your wife, pay your taxes, be a good person. 
and end up with the exact same feelings and results as actual sin if you aim at the wrong thing. Regret, remorse. He's saying here, Cain, what you sacrificed to me, I don't really care about. I don't care that you did this in my name. I, I want you to do what I need because that's all that I credit. Says so you missed the mark. And here's the really tricky part. It's a moving target, that target is, because in every season of life, there's different things that need to be important. Right now, I've got a very small child. Man, I'd love to be traveling more, but I'm in constant conflict with the fact that I need to be there for her because my presence is one of the most important things. A few years ago, I've talked about this before, uh, Emily commented to me that she felt like I was distant and absent. And she felt very alone. And I sat down and I said, all right, I got to figure out what I really value in this season of life. And here's what I came up with. My values right now are my relationship with God. I believe that that should never change. That should be the number one all the time. My second value is being present for my wife, then my, being present for my daughter, then caring for my health and providing financially. And what I started to realize was when that baby came along, I didn't know how much life was going to cost. And so I started freaking out about money. And so I started spending a lot of time on this right here that took me away from being present for my wife and my daughter. And the conflict came my wife says, I feel alone. And I'm like, what do you mean you feel alone? And it was because a lesser value providing financially had taken a higher priority over something that was of a higher value. And listen, not everything can have the same value in your life. If everything has the same value, nothing has value. You've got to decide what is the most important. And I believe God says there's an order to it. In fact, he says this. He says, look, I know you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear what you're going to drive in our case. But I'm telling you, the pagans even run after these things. People who don't even believe in God are freaking out about that stuff. And your heavenly father, he knows you need them. God made you with certain needs. But he says this, this is the crazy thing that he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things you're worried about, they'll be added to you as well. In some weird, mysterious way, when you seek what God values first, he takes care of all the rest of those things. And you don't have to worry about keeping your bag full. He says, hey, let me link up with me. I'll provide everything you need. You can carry a light burden on your shoulders and actually enjoy this life. But it comes when you focus on the right thing. So the kingdom of God is this. It's God's order. It's the, the order he says things should be in. It's how we live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities of life. And here's the really important thing. There are things that we all value, but there are things we should value that we don't even know we should value. And the only way you're going to figure out what you should value is in the word of God. And I believe there's a very specific order. And I think, I think Jesus modeled that for us. You know, whenever God asks anything for us, of us, he, uh, he does it himself and something always has to be sacrificed to make sure our priorities are in line with God's priorities. And there's this really crazy verse in the Bible that shows the greatest example of that. It says this, God loved the world so much that he sacrificed his own son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, the church is called the bride of Christ. And if you think about it in this order, God, God's bride, the church, you and me, sacrifice his own child for the sake of us. That's crazy that he loves us that much. But when, when that happens, when you make the right sacrifice, here's what I've seen over and over again. When you make the right sacrifice in the right season, the way God wants it, don't be surprised if the thing that you sacrificed and killed comes back to life later down the road in a more glorious form, just like his son did. My good friend, Misty, she, a uh, very ambitious lady, in her 20s, she started having kids. She felt like God said, I want you to lay down your career and raise those kids. I even want you to homeschool them. Again, this is a value for her. I'm not saying everybody needs to homeschool, but this is what she felt in her heart. She, didn't, she wasn't super excited about homeschooling, but she knew that's what God called her to do. So she sacrificed her ambition. Her last kid graduated about four years ago, and she decided it was time to step out. She felt like God gave her the go-ahead to start being ambitious again for something other than raising godly children. She started this podcast uh, organization for Christian podcasters. And God in the last four years has launched her onto the national stage. I'm telling you, she, in, even during COVID, 
In the last four years, God has done in her life what she couldn't have done in 20 years on her own. He launched her into her future. And I believe it's because she made the right sacrifice at the right time and she obeyed and honored what God asked of her. And then he brought the fulfillment to her. And not only that, he even brought back to life her dead dream in a more glorious form. And I've seen that over and over in my life, guys. You think you're making a sacrifice for God by doing what he asks, and he won't let you. God's not going to be a debtor to you. He's like, God, God I'm going to sacrifice for you. And he's like, no, watch this. I'm going to bring your dream back to life at the right time when you're ready for it. And I'm going to, this literally, I'm, I'm going to open the floodgates and blast you with blessing you never could have imagined. But it comes when you've decided to value what God values above what all the world says to value above maybe what your own little heart desires and say, God, I'm going to figure out what you value in this season. And I'm going to figure out what order it needs to be in. And whenever there's tension in my, in relationships, because here's how you can figure out if a value is out of order. There's typically tension in a relationship between you and someone you love. And that thing you're always bumping up against. And they're always like, why are you always, why are you always that? And we're, well, you're not being realistic. Well, but maybe you need to pay attention to it a little bit. And, and here's the other thing. Maybe you need to humble yourself a little bit and realize you can't carry the weight of the world. It feels heroic to carry the weight of the world and have everything on your shoulders. But somebody already did that. His name was Jesus. He carried that weight, a weight you could never carry. So relax a little bit and enjoy. And I'm telling you, I've had to preach this to myself, and it's been a slow thing I've learned. My wife just commented the other day. She's like, you're a lot more chill this year. I'm like, yeah, the Lord had to beat a lot of stuff out of me. <laughs> and I'm still way too intense, as you've heard this morning, but he's working in me, right? And he's doing the same thing in you. But a lot of it is, are you going to stop a lot of the unnecessary suffering by making the right sacrifices and asking to, and valuing what God says to value? And again, sometimes it means we need to let things go that are just not right for this season, some of you, you're worried about the spiritual health of your children, but you're gone every Sunday with soccer or motocross or whatever it is. And you go, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Listen, what you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. Even when I'm not here on a Sunday morning, you can bet I'm somewhere in the world at a church because church and the body of Christ is the most important thing to my family. And I'm not going to sacrifice it to go have my daughter play sports or be in art competitions on Sunday morning, which just ticks me off that they schedule those on Sunday morning. But you know what? The world's going to do what they're going to do. You got to do what you got to do to be different from the world. And taking your kids out of church on Sunday, I'm sorry. I have been, I've been in this rodeo long enough to see the results of it. You're not going to like it. You may think you're still spiritually strong, but your kids are not experiencing what you... Get your kids in church on Sunday, folks. I'm not kidding. You will pay the price if you don't. And I say that lovingly. Wounds from a friend can be trusted but enemy multiplies kisses. Anyway, my prayer for you guys is that, first of all, the first step in this is figuring out what needs to be sacrificed right now in this season, even good things. What's not accomplishing what God wants for us? You need to get on your knees and pray and ask him to show you what he wants you to do. You need to seek counsel. You need to actually, you know, if you can't figure out what needs to be sacrificed, talk to somebody you love. They know. Spending too much time golfing, spending too much time on the internet, whatever it is. Get dead serious about this because if you do these hard things, I can guarantee you, you'll like the results on the other side. But it takes doing really hard stuff because I've had to do it myself. And I haven't done it perfectly. You kind of bumble around and stumble around. But man, I am so grateful for where God's brought me to. And I'm going to live an example of what happens when you just, just humble yourself and, and just do whatever it takes to walk in line with what God values. It's exceedingly abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think if you make the right hard choices. All right, I'm turning off intense to well. <sighs> you guys receive that? Yes. All right. Hey, I've got this little check, checklist I give. I used, when I did my coaching, I charged $1,500 for this, okay? But I'm gonna give it to you for free. If you wanna scan, there's this QR code right here. If you wanna scan this, there's a little worksheet. It's super self-explanatory. Um, but to get it, you have to give me your email address so I can send you an email every Monday morning of an encouragement, okay? But if you want to sign up, it's a short little worksheet to help you kind of establish, here's what I value, and then narrow down what's really most important in this season. I'll leave it up. Secondly, um, ways you can give are going to be on, on the screen right here. Um, just 
So again, I want to reiterate, it's a really great time to give because you're matching gifts. If they'll, they'll be matched up to, to 20,000. But it has to be given specifically to the admin matching gift fund. But there's ways to give right there. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, I thank you so much that you made the ultimate sacrifice of your son for the sake of us, your bride, the church. You set the example for us. But you didn't just leave it at that. You brought back your son to life in a more glorious form. And I believe that is going to be the pattern we see in all our lives. Lord, as we sacrifice even the good stuff, the fun stuff, the stuff we like for what's most important, I thank you, Lord, that you're going to bring those things back to life in a more glorious form, something we couldn't have done on our own. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus, you've not committed, you're surrendered your way and given your life to him, um, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and mean in your heart, God is going to come in. He's going to forgive you of your sins and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with an eternal address in the kingdom of heaven. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you in the back. Um, Yeah, you guys are dismissed. Be blessed. We'll see you back here next week if you can handle another week of this. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.